Hello, this is Bryant Myers, author of PMF, The Fifth Element of Health. And in this video, we're going to look at Faraday's Law of Induction, which is the primary mechanism that PMF devices use to induce healing microcurrents and to recharge cellular voltage. So it's one of the most important videos in this series. So let's get started. Physicists learned a lot about electricity and magnetism in the 19th century. We already talked about one of the biggest discoveries that electric currents can generate magnetic fields. That was Ampere's law or the Biosavart law. And once scientists figured that out, they wanted to know if the opposite was also true. Could magnetic fields create or induce an electric current? Many physicists designed experiments to detect electric currents induced by magnetic fields, but they kept coming up empty. That is, until Michael Faraday figured out what was happening. It turns out that magnetic fields do induce electric currents, but only under certain circumstances when the magnetic field is changing with time. When Faraday discovered that magnetic fields induced electric currents, he got kind of lucky. He set up a current through a coil of wire so that it generates a magnetic field. And then he watched to see if a magnetic field induced a current in a second loop of wire, and it didn't. But then he noticed something weird. When he turned the current on and off in the first coil, there was a brief spike of current in the second coil, but only when the current was changing from on to off and from off to on. He realized he'd been looking for the wrong thing. A constant magnetic field did not cause an electric current in a loop of wire. Only a changing magnetic field did. And this is called Faraday's Law of Induction. And it says just that, that a changing magnetic field will induce an EMF in a loop of wire, which then drives the current in the wire. Okay, so back to Faraday and how EMFs are induced. As we saw, Faraday knew that when a magnetic field changed with time, it induced an EMF in a loop of wire, which caused the current to flow. So he saw that switching the current on and off induced the EMF. You can also change the strength of the magnetic field through a coil by moving a permanent magnet up and down really fast in the coil of wire. And this is also changing the magnetic field strength. Through an ammeter, you will see a current flowing. So here we see, uh, literally, a changing magnetic field creates a current. But now if you hold that magnet just constant, or you don't move it, nothing happens. It's only when you start changing it. You gotta change it kinda fast to get a current to move in the meter. And I've heard that the ancient Greeks even knew this. When they took lodestones for healing, they would make sure that they moved it really fast to create more of a dynamic healing effect. There are three ways that you can induce EMF in, in a loop of wire. And the first way we just saw is by changing the strength of the magnetic field, whether it's by switching a current on and off in one loop of wire, which creates a magnetic field that goes from on to off and off to on, or by taking a, a, a static magnet, moving it up and down really fast. But you can also induce EMF in two more ways. One way is by changing the area of the loop or the coil. And another way is by changing the angle between the magnetic field and the face of the loop. So in all three of these scenarios, what is actually changing is the magnetic flux. So in the first case, we did see that it was the changing magnetic field. But if you want to see what's the common denominator amongst all three ways to induce an EMF, it's a changing magnetic flux. Magnetic flux is a scalar quantity. It's essentially a measure of the total magnetic field running through a loop of wire, and it is equal to the area of the loop times the magnetic field if the field is uniform. Now, if it's not uniform, you have to use complicated calculus. We're going to stick to the kind of the easy non-calculus form with uniform changing fields, and it really illustrates the idea. Now, magnetic flux is measured in units of Tesla times meter squared, and that's one Weber. So a magnetic field strength of one Tesla running through an area, like a loop that has an area of, of a meter squared, will be a one Weber magnetic flux. And we usually use the Greek letter phi to designate flux. So magnetic flux is the property that most directly induces EMF and hence creating currents in a wire or moving charges in your body. Okay, now let's look at the master formula used to calculate EMFs, which is officially Faraday's law of induction. We just looked at how a change in flux induces an EMF that drives a current in a wire. With that idea alone, we're very close to the complete equation for Faraday's law in its non-calculus form. So here we have an EMF equals delta phi over delta t. That is, 
the induced EMF is going to be equal to the change of flux over the change in time. And the delta stands for change, phi stands for the flux, and T is time. This equation works through inducing an EMF in one loop of wire, but there are often many loops. So we have to multiply by N, or the number of turns, in a coil. For example, if there are two coils, we have to multiply by two, and if there are ten coils, we have to multiply by ten, because essentially each coil has that area, there are that amount of magnetic flux, so we have to multiply by each loop of wire. But we're still missing one thing. Faraday noticed that if a flux decreases over time, the EMF increases. And if the flux increases over time, the EMF decreases. So a minus sign is needed to give us the complete formula. So here we go. It's the EMF equals minus N times delta phi over delta T. And that is Faraday's law in its complete form. So what direction will the induced current flow? To figure that out, we need to use Lenz's law. You know how currents generate magnetic fields? Well, Lenz's law says that the magnetic field generated by the induced current will be in the direction opposite the change in the magnetic flux. So if you know the direction of change in magnetic flux, you can figure out the direction of the magnetic field generated by the current. And then you can use the right-hand rule to figure out the direction of the current. So Faraday's law of induction is kind of an inertial phenomenon. It's hard to get a current going through induction, and equally hard to stop or reverse its direction. A current in motion likes to stay in motion, just like mass. The reason the induced current generates an opposing magnetic field is that it takes energy and work to get a current going, moving from rest. And it's also worth noting that larger coils require more energy because there's going to be more magnetic flux and hence more of a possibility for more induced current. And therefore, when it comes to PMF devices, as we'll see, you're going to want larger coils will have a much greater effect than smaller coils for a given strength. So let's look at Faraday's law of the equation one more time. We have E equals minus N times delta phi over delta T. And what that means is the EMF, the induced EMF, which drives the current, is going to be equal to minus the number of turns or the number of loops of wire times the change in magnetic flux over change in time. Hopefully this will become clear because we're going to use this equation now and apply it to PMF devices in, in many different ways. Okay, we're going to go through several examples of how PMF and Faraday's law go hand in hand and why Faraday's law is so important in PMF therapy devices. The first is the importance of magnetic flux versus magnetic field strength alone. A lot of PMF companies will deceive you with magnetic field strengths alone. And I'm going to give you an example that's going to really drive this point home. Here in this image, you can see the OMI pad, which is only a one centimeter radius coil. And you can see next to it the IMRS pillow, which is 11 centimeters. Now remember, magnetic flux is the magnetic field times the area for a uniform magnetic field. And because area is pi r squared, if you double the radius, you quadruple the magnetic flux. If you increase the radius by four times, you're going to increase the magnetic flux by 16 times and so forth. So here we can see the IMRS uh, pillow coil is 11 times the radius of the OMI. And 11 squared is 121. So for a given field strength, the IMRS is going to have 121 times more magnetic flux. So you can see how easy it is to be misled by intensity alone. And when you're looking for a PMF device, please make sure to ask what is the diameter or the radius of each coil so you can calculate the magnetic flux, because that's what matters. So here's a helpful analogy to understand magnetic flux. Imagine two fans, one of those little tiny miniature handheld battery fans and a big large standing fan. Now both fans could have the same wind speed, but can you see that the small fan, you're only going to get a little tiny jet of air versus a big smooth stream from a large standing fan. Now this is a really good analogy because magnetic flux, as we've mentioned before, is very much like water flow and also wind flow. So when you use a larger coil, you're getting a much smoother and broader flow of magnetic field flux just like you get a, a much smoother and larger flow of air from a larger standing fan. And there are many cheaper PMF devices on the market that use and they just don't give you enough magnetic flux to really do any true healing. You know, there's a reason why the really good German or European based PMF devices cost more. Because there's a lot more energy in those coils and the signals are a lot more sophisticated. Typically they have to plug into the wall. You know, when you, ha when you use a battery powered PMF device, it's probably not giving you enough juice to really do some true healing.
So back to Faraday's law equation, we just looked at the flux. Now let's look at the n in the equation, the number of turns in the coil. So the more turns you have in your coil, the more flux is going to be created. So here's an example. You can see the IMRS probe versus the Beamer B-spot. Now the IMRS probe has over 100 turns around an iron core, and the B-spot only has around three or four turns, as you can see from this image. So what that means is the magnetic flux for a given current is going to be about 33 times greater on the IMRS probe than the B-spot. And it's actually more than that because the, the probe has a, a ferromagnetic core, as we talked about in the last module, that amplifies the field even much more so. So the point I'm trying to get here is that you want several turns, tightly wound copper, to give you a greater flow or a flux. So now let's look at delta phi over delta t, which is the change in flux. And the faster you change the magnetic flux, the greater will be the induced EMF. Remember from Faraday's law. So induction of EMF in PMF devices. PMF devices use changing currents to create changing magnetic fields. And this can be done by switching the current on and off in very complex ways. And the rhythmic switching on and off of an electric current in these current loops creates pulsating magnetic fields. From this changing current comes the waveform of the PMF signal. The most common waveforms used are the sine wave, square wave, and sawtooth. Now, therapeutically speaking, what is most important is the amount of time it takes for each wave to reach its peak. That is, how rapidly it rises and falls. And this can be represented in Faraday's law as delta phi over delta t, which means the change in magnetic flux divided by the change in time. Now, sometimes you will see this listed as dBdt, but it's more accurate to say delta phi over delta t because we have to factor in the area of the coils. So the faster the signal reaches its peak, the sharper or steeper the slope will be, and hence the greater the change in magnetic flux. Now, square wave and sawtooths have the greatest change in magnetic flux, and hence the greatest greatest biological and healing effect because their slopes are the steepest. Now keep in mind that the delta phi over delta t does also include the area of the coil, so larger coils along with a rapid rise and fall signal will give you the maximum magnetic induction. Magnetic field strength is also a part of the delta phi, but you don't need high intensity. It is best to use larger coils with a very clear high fidelity signal, which comes from good electronics and very tightly wound copper coils, and of course this rapid rise and fall signal. As we'll see in the next video, the key is frequency resonance, not intensity. And when you use high intensity, it can have damaging effects on the body. So back to the signal. Both the sawtooth and square wave have rapid rise and fall times that are far more abrupt than a simple sine wave or even a triangle wave or other waveforms. And here is the key point. The more abrupt the rise and fall time, the greater the induced EMF and hence the greater the biological effect. Waveforms like a sine wave or triangle wave have gradual rise and fall times and are not capable of maximum ion transport. These devices ignore the many studies that demonstrate the profound biological effects of waveforms with sharp rise and fall times, such as the sawtooth and square wave. For example, the NASA study in 2003 by Dr. Goodwin showed that a 10 hertz square wave had the maximum biological effects of cells and culture, and interestingly, he used a very low intensity as well. And I'll put a link below this video so you can look up that study yourself. Now, I just want to make a couple notes here. An idealized square wave, or even sawtooth, is never going to be a perfectly vertical line. It'll be more of a trapezoid than a square wave, but it's still going to be close enough. And I'm going to do a future video on the signal in, in Fourier series and transforms and how these waveforms are created. But most good PMF devices, like the IMRS and, and like some others, use a very good square wave and sawtooth signal. There are some cheaper devices that I've analyzed, like the OMI, which I couldn't even recognize a square wave, even though they claim to use a square wave. So again, I'm, I'm going to do a future video on that, but it's important to make sure that you're actually getting a square wave if the company says it's a square wave. Another thing is sine waves have the most gradual rise and fall and a very low change in flux for a given intensity and much less healing power because of induction. They're still better than static magnets, but definitely not ideal. And here's a helpful analogy to understand why a sawtooth and square wave are more effective than sine waves. Think of when you start a fire with a piece of flint and a stone. You strike the stone with the flint quickly and abruptly to create a spark of energy. You're not going to slowly rub it back and forth, right? Another good example is credit card readers, which do have a little coil to, to register the induction. A faster swipe equals a bigger signal, which is more induction. I mean, doesn't that make sense? You're not going to take your credit card and slowly move it back and forth. There won't be enough induction to register the signal. So let's continue to look at sine waves here, because a lot of PMF companies do use a sine wave, which I honestly don't understand why, but they do. One of their justifications is that a sine wave is more natural. 
And this is just not true. The simple sine wave is not found in nature. The Schumann resonance and geomagnetic frequencies are much more complex. For starters, consider that the Schumann resonances are generated from lightning strikes, which are anything but sine waves. Have you ever seen a sine wave lightning bolt? And there's been many, many studies done to plot and show the Schumann resonances. And you can see this 1990 study, this graph here. And you can see the rapid rise and fall of the Schumann, especially the lower harmonics. But again, the actual Schumann resonance is a superposition of all these harmonics, so it's going to give you a very complex waveform. And you can see here also from the Global Coherence Initiative, they actually daily monitor the Schumann resonances. You can see these plots here, and they're anything but a sine wave. You can see they're very, very jagged, very abrupt. And, I mean, doesn't it make sense that nature would use a rapid rise and fall for maximum induction for all of life on Earth? So in conclusion, and based on what we just learned about Faraday's law of induction, I want to go through five things that you want to look for in a PMF therapy device. Number one, you want to make sure to get a full body mat device to cover your whole body because you want to create induction and energize all your 37 trillion cells. Number two, you want to make sure that the unit has tightly wound, perfectly circular copper coils, and many turns in the coil even helps more. Number three, make sure it uses a rapid rise and fall signal like a sawtooth or a square wave. Number four, Make sure it has lower intensities for safety and efficacy. And number five, make sure it uses biologically active frequencies in the 0 to 50 hertz range. And we're going to talk about that more in the next module. Thanks for watching. In the next module, we're going to finally get to Maxwell's equations, and we're going to see how they summarize everything that we've learned in this course. Plus, we're going to see there was something new that Maxwell added to Ampere's law that allowed us to understand light as an electromagnetic phenomena. And I'm going to conclude the video showing you all the different types of energies in energy medicine, how they're different from each other in their healing and therapeutic effects.